today's tutorial, we're going to be looking at risk assessments. Now, before we start looking into how to complete a risk assessment, it's important that we have an understanding of the terminology and language used. So what do we mean by the term risk? When we discuss the term risk, what we're actually referring to is the likelihood of something happening. So if we're saying something is high risk, we're suggesting that it's highly likely to happen. If something is low risk, then there is little chance of it happening. When we use the term or word hazard, we're referring to something that actually could cause harm to someone or something. So a hazard in a kitchen, for example, could be a kitchen knife. It's hazardous because there is a potential for you to injure yourself or somebody else by using it incorrectly. If you were to take a walk outside on an icy day, the hazard would be the icy conditions. There is the risk that you could slip on the ice and cause yourself injury. So let's look at some of the ways that we can hurt ourselves. Slips, trips and falls, especially in practical workshops or kitchens, are easy ways that we can then injure ourselves from. Manual handling, carrying large heavy objects, perhaps that are too heavy, put you at risk. This could be from muscle strain, it could be from blunt object injury if you drop the box on you, especially if you're picking it up from a height, perhaps from above your head. Perhaps one of the most common ways of injuring yourself at home or in the kitchen is from fire and electrical fires. So what are the ways that we can injure ourselves in terms of what harm can be done to our bodies? Let's look at the most common ways you can injure yourself in the kitchen. Well, firstly, if you're using knives, then there is a good chance if you're not observing the proper rules when using a knife, that you could cut yourself. Now, this could be a little nick or it could be more serious. This is why it's so important to handle knives properly. It's easy to burn yourself from hot water in a scald or just from handling hot food and pans. Again, this could be treated at home if it is a minor injury under cold water or it might need more medical intervention and hospital treatment. Bruises are the types of injuries you might get from slipping or falling onto other objects or perhaps from dropping objects onto yourself. But it's not all doom and gloom. There are control measures we can put in place to reduce the risk of these injuries occurring. This is where a risk assessment comes into play. This helps us to manage risk and to put control measures in place to keep everybody safe. So let's look at how you write a risk assessment. A good risk assessment should cover five points. I was known as a five point risk assessment. Step one is to identify the risk factors. What is potentially going to cause harm? Highlight the danger. Step two is identifying who could be harmed. It might be yourself, it might be another individual, or it could be a group of people. Step three is really important. Evaluate the risks. This is where you consider what can be done to reduce the risk. This is where you write what the control measures could be. What steps are you going to take to prevent an accident from happening? Step four is to record your findings. Now this might be just writing it down on a template, keeping a record of what you've actually found out. Step five is monitoring and reviewing. Your risk assessment might need to be altered from time to time as circumstances change. So this will need to be monitored on a regular basis. So let's look at a specific scenario to understand how a risk assessment works in practice. Let's look at the scenario of a hospital and cleaners washing the floors and corridors regularly to maintain hygienic practice. Now, step one, identifying the risk factors. The risk here is a slippery floor could cause somebody to slip over and injure themselves. Who is at risk of injury? Well, as well as staff working within the hospital, it'd be members of the public, some of whom might already be injured or unwell. Step three, evaluating the risk 
what preventative and control measures can we put in place to reduce the risk of this happening? Well, a standard would be using a wet floor sign to warn people that the floors are wet. Let's look at another scenario. Let's look at the kitchen in a working restaurant or cafe. There are many risk factors in a kitchen, but if we look specifically at the oven, one of them could be burns or electrical fires as a result of faulty equipment. Step two, identifying who could be hurt from this, or well, the person in immediate risk would be the chef working with the oven, but ultimately customers and other staff within the restaurant could be at risk of harm. Preventative measures could be to ensure that you check equipment regularly for faults, ensuring there are no frayed wires, for example. So a risk assessment effectively is a formal documentation that helps us to think about where the risks and hazards are in our workplace. But most importantly, it means that we think about the control measures we can put into place to prevent injury or harm coming to somebody. That's why it's so important to conduct risk assessments, especially in the workplace. But believe it or not, you probably conduct risk assessments multiple times every day. You don't necessarily write them down though. For example, when you're about to cross a road, you know to stop, look and listen for cars coming. You're identifying that the hazard is the car. You've identified that you are at risk of getting hurt if you step out into the road without first checking. That control measure is you stopping, listening and looking for the cars. Another control measure might be ensuring that you cross at a crossing or making sure that you have a clear view of what is coming up from the road ahead.